so let's go over pretest 3a question by question i want you to remember every single question that is on the test is somehow somewhere reflected on this pretest i literally make the test on moodle and then i make a, i copy the question i put it into um the pretest like into this word document and then i change something in every question maybe i change the number maybe i change um a part of the question uh, uh you know come at it from a slightly different angle but if you can do this pretest, you are prepared for virtually i would go so far as to say all questions that you would see on your test and the minute i see a student get a poor grade on the test i know it's not about how smart they are it's all about their preparation the performance is a function of the preparation so make sure you prepare thoroughly by looking over not only pretest 3a but also pretest 3b and the best strategy to do this is you you've done the pretest, you looked over the answers already and then if you have anything else wrong use this slider on the bottom to scroll to where the specific question that you're having a hard time with is and then go over that question if you want to listen to them all you can listen to them all that's completely up to you do that for both pretest a and pretest 3b don't think for a second that i said hmm how can i waste my time today I think I'll make an extra pretest. Trust me, I have things in my life I enjoy much more. I would have done those. Instead, ask yourself, hmm, he made two pretests for a reason. I think I'm going to need to practice both of them to get my maximum grade. There are some students in here who I'm a little concerned about whether or not they're going to pass the class for the year. And I want to make sure I give you every opportunity to do that. Okay. So, without any further ado, <clears throat> we have the first question uh, if negative 3n plus 5 is negative 22 evaluate 3n plus 4. so this actually asks you to combine two <clears throat> skills at once the first is can you solve an equation standard two-step equation subtract 5 from both sides that's negative 27 danger 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 don't forget that's a negative 3 divide both sides by negative 3 and we get 9. but that's not the answer they're looking for they want you to evaluate 3 times 9 plus 4, right? That's what 3n means, 3 times 9, or 3 times n, and n is 9. So 3 times 9 is 27, plus 4 is 31. Number 2, Mary takes home $4,950 each month. Mary pays $1,600 for rent each month and another $300 for her car payment. What total percent, rounded to the nearest whole number, of her monthly income goes to rent and her car payment? Well, first we have to figure out how much money we're talking about for the rent and the car payment. So that's where over here, I add the 1,600 and the 300 to get 1,900. And remember, percent is part over whole. So I do the 1,900 divided by 4950, which I get 0.38 when I round it off, and then I gotta convert to a percent. So it's 38%. Number three is to solve these two equations and um, generally speaking we did very well on these equations on our last test so I'm confident that you'll do well again distributing the 3 3x minus 12 plus x equals 13 minus x since these x's are on the same side same operation combine the like terms 3x and 1x is 4x minus 12 is 13 minus x always start with the smallest number of x's when they're on opposite sides so opposite side opposite operation add x to both sides 5x minus 12 is 13. Standard two-stepper, adding the 12, dividing by 5. x is 5. Another one similar to this, distribute the 5. 10x minus 5 minus 2x is 4x plus 11. Same side, same operation. 10x is minus 2x is, is 8x's. I didn't touch the minus 5, so it's still there. Equals 4x plus 11. Subtract 4x from both sides. 4x minus 5 is 11. Add 5 to both sides, 4x is 16, dividing by 4x is 4. So, again, we did very well on the last test with this. This is just a, a, a reminder to make you say, hey, am I able to do those kind of questions? Because you will see one or more of those on your test. Number four, as a seventh grader, Scott weighed 76 pounds. As an eighth grader, he weighed 94 pounds. To the nearest whole number, what percent? is Scott's relative change in weight. So you need the relative difference over the original amount. So the relative difference is 94 minus 76, that's 18. 
divided by the original amount, which is 76. And again, part of a whole. Um, 18 divided by 76 is 0.24 when you round it off, which is 24%. Okay, so um, on the last test, a lot of students got this right working it the old way that I showed you. I wanted to show you a new way to do it for this particular test for any students who may have felt they're still struggling a little bit with the old way to do things. So this way is to solve proportionally and say, look, euros is to dollars as euros is to dollars. So one euro is a dollar nine. How many dollars is 85 euros? So I put my euros in the top, so the 85 goes in the top. I cross multiply, uh, one times X is just X, and 85 times 109 is 92.65. So X is 92.65 euros. What are the first quartile, median, third quartile, minimum, and maximum of the data depicted on the box plot or by the box plot below? This is always your minimum right here. And then after your minimum right here, we go to the first quartile, then we go to the median, then we go to the third quartile, and then we go to the maximum. So minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and then the max right there. So what is the median, the minimum value? It's about 15, the first quartile. I'd say that's about 18 and uh, 17 and a half. The median's about 21. Third quartile's about 27 and a half. The maximum is about 30. Number seven, compare the range of group A to the range of group B. We're basically looking for which one is greater. So the range is the max minus the min. So I do the max minus the min. For group A, it's 65 minus 60, sorry, 65 minus five, and that equals 60. And for group B, it's 66 minus eight, which is 58. So which range statement of comparison can you make? Well, the range of A is greater than the range of B. On the next one, you're given three sets of data, set one, set two, and set three. And I ask three different questions. Which of those sets has the highest mean? Which has the highest median? And which has the biggest range? So what I did was I went and I found all three means. Remember to find the mean, it's nothing more than the average. So I add them up and divide by five. By them, I mean all the scores in set one to get the mean for set one. All the scores for set two, divide by five, get the mean for set two and so on. I find the median, which means I ordered them. Make sure you order them first. Found the one in the middle. Here's your three medians. And then I defined the range. I did highest minus lowest. And what did it work out to? Set three had the highest mean, set three had the highest median, set two had the highest range. Which box plot represents the data with the smallest devi standard deviation? Well, the smallest standard deviation is more than likely going to be associated with the tightest, most condensed um, box plot. And that's what we have here. That's the smallest one, most condensed numbers. Match each graph to the corresponding values. Now, these are not the actual definite values, but like, for instance, here's my two negatives. Remember, a negative correlation is like a negative slope. It goes down and to the right, reading left to right. The tighter the points are to the line, the closer it is to a negative one. So because this graph here that I'm pointing to with the negative 0.9, the points are tighter to the graph than the other one, then the other one has to be negative 0.8, and this one has to be negative 0.9, okay? Likewise, with the positive graphs, you can see that the points in this upper right graph with 0.9 are just a little tighter to the graph than for the one underneath here, so we gave that the 0.8. Which graph below has no correlation? No correlation is when everything is kind of in a state of entropy or anarchy. Everything's just spread out all over the place. There's no general trend up or down. The Pythagorean theorem. Um, we've done a lot of Pythagorean theorem questions in our Praxis prep, and we'll hit some in, in as a part of our regular class before the end of the year. So I figured it's a good time to put a couple of questions in. Remember, Pythagorean theorem is leg squared plus leg squared is hypotenuse squared. This, or a squared plus b squared is c squared. 
didn't notice they were very good about it. They put the C across from the hypotenuse. So the legs are, or A and B are 5 and 12. So 5 squared plus 12 squared is C squared. 25 and 144 is C squared. They're on the same side, so you just, same operation, combine like terms. 169 is C squared. Square root both sides, C is 13. But for the example underneath that, now we have it a little bit different because the X is on a leg. So it's X squared plus 15 squared is 21 squared. And again, the 21 is right across from the right angle. That's how I can tell it's the hypotenuse. So X squared plus 225, 15 squared is 225, equals 21 squared is 441. Subtracting the 225, and I get X squared is 216. So X will be the square root of 216. X is 14.7. Now, that's rounded off to the nearest tenth. Sometimes they'll ask you to leave the answer as a radical. If that's the case, you leave it radical 216. And sometimes they'll say express it as a decimal, round it off to a particular decimal place. Number 13, Jenny invests in a bond that pays 4% annual interest. She invests 5000 in the bond and matures in 10 years. How much does the bond earn in interest? So this was a question that we did at least two, maybe three or four times in our a review question segment during class. And the reason we did that is because I found that this was one of the most commonly missed questions on the last test, and we have to learn how to do it. In my opinion, I equals PRT is really easy, and I think everybody in, this, in the class can get it right. My problem is, I don't think everybody remembered that a bond is always simple interest. So, <laughs> my, you know, unfortunately, an old teacher of mine from years ago, I was not particularly close with him, Mr. Payne passed away a couple of weeks ago, and he always used to say, everybody pay attention now, jot this down. So somewhere, somehow, do what it takes to remember that a bond pays simple interest. So I equals PRT, principles 5,000 times the interest rate, which is 0 0.04, converting that decimal to a percent, 10 years, 5,000 times 0 0.04 times 10 is 2,000. Number 14, Todd invests 50 grand in a retirement account that earns 14% compounded monthly. Monthly is a big word right there. If the money is invested for 20 years, how much will he earn? So this is the equation. I had suggested that you put that um, in your phone under an album's picture so that you could reference it whenever you get a question about compounded monthly or anything because this can compound by the month, this formula. It can compound by the week. It can compound semi-annually. Um, can compound by the day. The one thing it doesn't do is compound continuously, but we don't cover that in this class. So uh, the amount that's going to be in the account is 50,000 times 1 plus 0.14. Remember to convert that percent to a decimal divided by 12 to the 12 times 20 power. Yes, this N is the same N in the formula. The N's are the same. And here the N's are the same. So 12 times 20 is 240. If I do 1 plus 0.14 divided by 12, I will get 1.01167. And then I just let the calculator do its thing, and I come up with $809,654. Okay, so again, if you're compounding the interest, this is the formula you're going to use. A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the NT power. And if you are doing simple interest, it's I equals PRT. Remember which formula is which. Number 15, Jesse invests 3,000 at 18% interest. How much money will it be worth in 12 years? Well, um, what we're looking here is, is that thing's doubling because it's 18% interest. Um, you could plug in the number into the formula and, and work it all out, but it's a little bit quicker to do. 72 divided by 18 is 4. So you start off with $3,000. In 4 years, you have $6,000. In 8 years, you have $12,000. And in 12 years... You have $24,000. So can you use the formula? Sure. It's a lot quicker to just go with the rule of 72 and double it every four years. Three doubled is six, doubled is 12, doubled is 24. Number 16, a jacket's on sale for 25% off. The normal price of the jacket's 92 bucks. What's the new sales price? So it's 25% of 92. So 25% is 0.25, of means multiply. 92.25 times 92 is 23. Now you've gone shopping a lot in your life. If something is on sale, then its price is decreased. 
So 92 minus 23 is 69. Last but not least, number 17. In your class of 20 students, now you're a teacher. 10 of them receive a B on a test. Five get an A, two get a C. Three students fail. What percent of the students pass your test? So your principal boss walks in the room and says, hey, how, what percent of the kids pass the test? And generally speaking, in public schools at least, like 80% is kind of like if you're under 80%, the principal starts to twitch and starts to panic. But if you're over 80%, the principal feels pretty good about it. So what's the percent? So percent over 100 equals, now the part that passed is 17, right? 10 plus 5 plus 2 out of the whole class, which is 20. So we cross multiply, 20N is 1700, dividing by 20 and we get N is 85. Okay, so those are, there's 20 questions on your test, there's 17 questions on your pretest. Obviously, some of these pretest questions um, have multiple parts to them, um, or it can be looked at in one or two different ways, but anything on the test is absolutely positively available on the pretest and the video. So performance is a function of preparation. Prepare hard, it'll be worth it in the end. You'll get a really good grade and go a long way toward getting you where you wanna be in the class.